Let's get right over to the phones because taking time out of his day as he's done for us each and every Monday since this pandemic began back in 2020, it's our good friend Dr. Dennis Norm from Mercy Health. Dr. Norm, good morning to you. Good morning to you guys. How's everything going this morning? It's going well. I just don't like your forecast for the end of the week. <laughs> just go to Arizona. You'll be fine. Yeah. Because uh, in Arizona, what do they put up on the screen? Just hot and just move on from there? Weather lasts like 10 seconds? Uh, pretty much. They, they might add a cloud here and there, but that's about it. <laughs> Something newsworthy. Right. You know, hey, there might be a cloud there. You, you know, know. Get, the, get the kids out of school, have a look. Right around noon, we may see but. something. But around here, yep, we'll, uh, we'll we'll take that roller coaster that we get. A bunch of things to kick around with you in the uh, in the COVID department this morning. One of them kind of jumped out at me as I'm seeing this uh, everywhere from the Associated Press. You've got a uh, doctor, Dr. Peter Chin Hong, who's an infectious disease expert, University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine. Um, he doesn't think COVID's really ever going to disappear. He says, quote, until vaccine equity is established, until people are not hesitant about the vaccine, this is not going to go away. It's going to stick around. It's going to have flares. Quoting him again, unless we vaccinate everyone at the same time, you'll have flares. And every time you have a flare, there's a possibility of creating variants. What's your take on what he says? I think that that's fairly credible. Uh, we're already seeing the fact that uh, countries that are not very far along with vaccinations are seeing uh, flares and upticks. You know, India is a good example. Uh, very few people, less than I think 2%, have been vaccinated. And now that Indian variant is creating real problems in India, and it's now present in the United States. I saw a story that said that we've identified it somewhere in central southern Illinois, along with at least several other states. And if we don't get ourselves vaccinated, you know, in that 85, 90% range, we're going to see players with the, especially with these variants. When you, when, you, when you say we, do you mean us as uh, as the United States or, or we as a, as a global community? I, well, both, really both. Uh, even in the United States, where we're fairly far, the lo far along, we're going to see flares. But in the global community, clearly we're going to see hot spots because the uh, ability to vaccinate uh, the majority or all the people is going to be a very difficult task. And I think his point about timing is, is well taken. Uh, the longer it takes to get a population vaccinated uh, with these flares, the more likely we see these variants uh, because the uh, virus has more opportunity to mutate as it sort of percolates along in a community. He, uh, he talks about vaccine hesitancy. It's uh, hardly an American-only problem. You got a Gallup poll finding that nearly 1.3 billion adults worldwide would not agree to be vaccinated. Only two in three adults worldwide said they would get the vaccine even if it were available to them at no cost, which is not enough for global herd immunity, if I have my math right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, the we don't really know for sure what we need for herd immunity, but clearly we need to get to 75, 80% for herd immunity. You know, if we could get our vaccines to 100%, we could maybe stamp this thing out, but it's pretty clear that we're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, there are areas of the world that we can't even get our basic vaccines accomplished uh, historically. So I'm sure that this one is not going to uh, be able to be given there. Uh, but it is disturbing that we see one out of three people who don't want to take the vaccine. And uh, I guess I don't completely understand that. I know some of it is people are afraid it hasn't been out long enough, blah, blah, blah. But there seems to be a, I almost use the word vaccine belligerence. It's one of those things where you should do this and, and it's an attitude, well, I'm not going to do what somebody else tells me to do. I'm just not going to do that. And I don't quite understand that, that idea. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hong here uh, says measles are a good example of what he's talking about. He says a lot of people are immunized against uh, measles, but not everyone. And that still means that you still have outbreaks occasionally when somebody travels from elsewhere and exposes a large group of people who are not vaccinated. Think of it as being sort of the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. Uh, uh, we see that with uh, uh, even some other viruses. Uh, and clearly we've talked about flu, how we uh, try to... Uh, get everybody vaccinated against flu, but there are a lot of people that pass on flu shots and we see flu outbreaks, although we feel like we have it under fairly good control. But uh, this vaccine hesitancy is something that, that 
is really going to create problems for us down the road. Uh, we've asked this before, and but maybe we have new information now. But does this mean booster shots uh, coming up every year for for COVID prevention? It sounds like that's where we're heading. I saw an article that uh, China is already uh, in the process of recommending booster shots for their vaccine uh, because they find that their immunity is uh, waning after six months. But we have to remember the Chinese vaccine, by their own admission, was not the most efficient vaccine, and it's an old-style vaccine. So we're still not quite sure on the messenger RNA vaccine, the Pfizer and Moderna, but it looks like we're probably going to need some kind of booster shot and also, as we've discussed with some of these variants, the vaccines that we currently have may not be quite as effective, and we need to tailor these booster shots to the new variants. It seemed, it seemed like the, the vaccine we have now is uh, you know, somewhat of a, glo a global effort. I mean, um, AstraZeneca not, not available here, but, uh, but you know, Moderna and, and, and Pfizer all, all, all around the world. Will the same thing happen with booster shots? Will, uh, will that be a, a global effort and, and we'll get data from other countries or will each country be left to their own, uh, you know, ways to get their own boosters out? No, I think it'll be a, a global effort. As we've seen, uh, it's very difficult to keep the vaccine or the, excuse me, the variants isolated in one area of the world. So I think it's clearer that the companies that are going to be making the boosters, and I know Moderna and Pfizer, are, I think, are already looking at it. They're looking at the variants that are popping up that are going to be problematic, and they're trying to develop shots specifically for those variants. So it has to be a global effort to be effective. One of the other things that's kind of, a, I guess, a side note, side effect uh, of the pandemic. I'm looking at a story this morning saying the pandemic has fueled eating disorder surge in not only just teens, but in adults as well. Saying the pandemic's created treacherous conditions for eating disorders, um, leading to a surge of new cases and relapses that isn't abating as restrictions are loosened. Uh, the problem is uh, people, uh, teens and adults seeking help for eating disorders are finding it takes months to get an appointment in some cases. And I think this gets back to the effects of the general health uh, uh, issues of uh, depression. We've talked about that, the depression and isolation and eating disorders certainly are aggravated. When people are isolated, depressed, can't get out. And I think we all kind of see that. I, I, I don't think I have an eating disorder, but I've certainly gained 10 pounds over the last uh, several months. It just seems like when you can't go out and you can't do as many things, you can always eat. And uh, food is uh, definitely comforting, but uh, it's certainly not what we want to see in terms of our health. And as we've mentioned, uh, unfortunately, obesity is a major risk factor for COVID. Congrats on keeping it to just 10 pounds over COVID. Well, yeah, because I'm, well, I'm seeing people online calling it the COVID-15, sure. the COVID-25. Right, right, just the COVID-10. So that's, that's, that's good restraint. Yeah. Well, that's all I'll admit to. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, I shared an article with Riley uh, last week about, uh, about about testing, about COVID nineteen testing and and uh, PCR versus versus antigen testing, and uh, th we 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 touched on it last week too about uh, about the Yankees, uh, you know, having having nine cases, uh, positive test cases, even though you know everyone's vaccinated. And it turns out maybe it has to do with viral load when we're dealing with you know ten parts per billion. That's not actually it can infect anybody, but you you still carry it. How Will we look back and will we see how, how wrong doing PCR testing for, for our, our baseline was when we should have maybe doing something else? What, what is history going to tell us about our, our testing system that we, we were doing, you know, eight, nine months ago? Well, I think our history is going to tell us <clears throat> that we should probably have been doing more testing, and regardless of what type of testing. Uh, early on, there was a lot of concern about the accuracy, the specificity uh, of the uh, testing. And I think that was uh, not to be unexpected. Uh, those were relatively new tests. Uh, people were coming uh, up with all kinds of different variations on the testing. So I think looking back at it, yeah, there were a lot of bumps in the road when we were doing testing, but it would have been nice if we could have done more testing earlier. It would have allowed us, I think, to isolate people quicker uh, it would have maybe allowed some kind of contact tracing, which was really kind of a total failure. So I think that uh, my comment on testing would be that we we didn't 
have good enough testing early enough. We didn't do enough testing. Will there ever be a, an at-home type test for COVID? Yes. I think there's... Uh, already is. I think there already is. If I remember, I can't remember the name of the company. I think Abbott... Abbott Lab. Lab. Yeah, Abbott, right. Abbott Laboratories has got uh, a couple of different variations of a home test. Yeah, and I think there's a couple other companies. Uh, generally speaking, those tests are not quite as accurate, but... Uh, Certainly, uh, it's something that uh, uh, can help people if they want to go that direction. Speaking of helping out people, Joe and I have been watching with great interest, Dr. Dorham. The Olympics were postponed last year because of all this. Uh, up until this year, we're about two months away from what would be the, the opening of the Games. You had polling in Japan running 85 or 80 to 85 percent against having the Olympics here in a couple of months due to the pandemic. And you've got a Japanese population that it seems on the high end has been vaccinated only at a rate of 2%. If you had to lay down a wager, the Olympics going to happen? Uh, after looking at uh, the news here in the last day, I'm thinking it's not going to happen. You may have seen their second largest city is just overwhelmed with COVID right now. Right. Uh, they're in a crisis. They've run out of ICU beds, uh, respirators. Uh, given that, and it's only two months to the Olympics, I just don't see how they're going to be able to handle it. And the big concern is clearly with all those participants coming there, even though they don't have spectators, they're young people, they're healthy people. You can screen them, you can test them, but they're going to bring in COVID. Uh, that's just the way it is. And I just can't see the country uh, being able to get their own outbreak under control in the next eight weeks. So I'm thinking that maybe this is not going to happen. We, we, we might be treading a little f further into geopolitical waters than I usually like to, but why isn't a, a, a well-developed country like Japan not have any vaccines? Well, apparently they, like some other countries, concentrated a lot on you know testing and quarantining and isolating and all that, and they were fairly successful early on, but they kind of ignored the vaccine part of it. As we've discussed uh, what's happened in India, even though India is a major vaccine manufacturer, uh, they really kind of messed around and didn't get their act together, didn't get the vaccine on track. And I think Japan, I don't believe, manufactures their own vaccine. So they, they didn't get into uh, purchasing early on. Mm. So they've been kind of left behind, and they had success with, again, quarantining and contact tracing. But now that's come back to really bite them. So yeah, it's it really, really has. Unfortunate. Yeah, it really has. Yeah, a 4% maximum, but uh, they figure the average is 2% of the Japanese population being uh, being vaccinated with a high degree of, uh, of um, people not real sure whether they want to take that shot either. Well, and on top of that, they're an uh, older population. Mm. Uh, they're one of the average, uh, oldest average populations in the world so COVID is a very big problem for them in terms of hospitalizations and deaths and they're, and they're seeing the same problems with the, the older it, it hitting the older uh, population worse than the younger one right well absolutely in terms of your hospitalizations and deaths the, the older population just doesn't do as well and as we've discussed uh, even if the older population is vaccinated uh, older people don't respond as well to the vaccine so you see a little more likelihood that it may make a person a little sicker even if they've been vaccinated. Speaking of things going on in Asia, I'm looking at this this morning, too. you got over 100 virus cases on Mount Everest. We have over 100 confirmed positive tests for COVID-19 on Mount Everest, uh, despite, despite Nepal saying, oh, no, that none, none of that is happening. <laughs> uh, you, you have people providing evidence. China pulled the plug on climbs to Everest from their side of Mount Everest last week due to fears the virus could be spread from the Nepalese side. But now, yeah, you've got uh, over 100 virus cases in all places, Mount Everest. Yeah, I found that a very interesting story. Uh, they, there's something in the neighborhood of five or 600 people at that base camp, and, and at least 100 uh, have the uh, virus, as far as anyone can tell. And, of course, the uh, official government... Uh, agency isn't going to admit that but it just shows when you get people living that close together in very tight uh conditions even though they're quote outside 
end quote. You know, when they get together in those tents, there's not much ventilation. That virus spreads very rapidly. And I'm surprised that they didn't anticipate that that could be a problem. You would think they would have suggested or required that people be vaccinated before they let them do this. Although I don't know a whole lot about Mount Everest climbing, but I know they get there months ahead of time. So that may be part of the issue. Yeah, and and kick out a whole bunch of money. And in some cases, only to be get all the way over there and be told, sorry, uh, we've got some COVID problems here. Nobody's going up. So, uh, yeah. That's yeah, a- and they missed the whole season, I believe, last year. The whole season was canceled. Right. Mm-hmm. So yep. there are a uh, huge demand this year. And, and I know in terms of the economics, uh, that's a huge motivator to kind of push things through and kind of say, well, let's hope we don't get a COVID outbreak. But that's not a good place to have COVID, especially <laughs> with the low, the low oxygen levels uh, at that uh, uh, altitude. Uh, having COVID would not be a good thing. Oh yeah, with the, yeah that would that would make things even. I never considered the low out the low oxygen element of things. Yeah, not 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 a place you want to be and feel poorly for any reason, especially for COVID. Dr. Norm, as always, we appreciate the time. We appreciate the expertise. Uh, we'll look forward to getting together again next week and see if we made any new progress. Yeah, it sounds good, guys. Take care. We appreciate Great. it. This is our friend, Dr. Dennis Norm from Mercy Health.